Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to TCAP webinar. My name is Azra Sayed. I'm a TCAP training coordinator. Today's training is on the TCAP webinar on architectural design, construction, and inspection process. I'll just like to provide some house rules before we get we get started on the presentation so we can use the presentation for future use. To avoid interruptions and background noise during the training, please keep your microphone muted, cameras off during the training. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we will answer all the questions at the end of the training. Now I'll turn it over to Ryan uh, to introduce the presenter and get started, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I just want to mention something. Um, we do, we talk about, most of you have been here before. Um, for those that are new, we talk about that we record these sessions. What do we do with these sessions? We're currently working on putting in the, putting them up on YouTube um, so that everybody can have access to them once again and review them. So that's coming up really, really soon. You've probably been watching like, hey, we record them. What's the purpose of it? It's because of that. Uh, we're currently working internally to make that happen, and we should make that happen um, within the next few weeks. So uh, for the next webinar, for the following webinar, sorry, not the next one, following ones, we should have, and you will receive a notification in an email where with the playlist and everything that goes on. So with that, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this TCAP webinar on architectural design, construction, and inspection process. Today, we have a full set of presenters, and we are going to be covering every aspect of the architectural discipline, design, construction, and inspection. These are the three, the three main phases that we look into the TCAP process. As you all know, the TCAP is a tenant construction and alteration process. We use it to manage alterations and new construction within tenant leaseholds at the Port Authority facilities, and we uh, comply with local building and health codes, other applicable regulatory authorities, but we have an imposition of a higher level of standards here at the Port Authority, such as sustainability, accessibility, MWBE, um, and program specific requirements as necessary. Our mission, we work with you. We work with our tenants to accomplish completion of projects as quickly as possible, while we maintain adherence to applicable building codes and regulations and PA policies. There is something we would like for you to do. Keep this in mind. You're going to see this at the beginning of every presentation and at the end of this presentation is we want to hear from you. If there is something in specific that you would like for us to talk about during future presentations, let us know. Scan this QR code or let me just copy and paste this presentation over here. This and put it in the chat box. Where's the chat box? So if I lose it. So that you can here we go this link you can let our presenters know how they did how everything is going um, our presenters today in order of appearance we have brian johnson who is a principal car architect here in the port authority engineering department quality assurance division he is a registered architect in the city of in the state of new york city new jersey with over 20 years of experience we have carmela sinocolo who is 20 plus years 22 plus years at the Port Authority. She is stationed at LaGuardia Airport at Construction Management Division and is a resident engineer. Along with her is Daniel Pineda, who is engineering for the Construction Management Division as well. Four years with the Port Authority, um, started in 2019 with the Associate Engineers Program and is a civil engineer um, and has been at the LaGuardia Airport for the past three years. And we also have Jamal Albogales, who is the supervising structural engineer. Um, he is in charge of all the engineers who attend QAD inspections, tests, walkthroughs throughout the Port Authority, all inspections except fire protection and vertical transportation. He is a civil structural engineer by education with over 30 years of experience, mostly in quality assurance and 30 years with the Port Authority. So without further ado, it's a long presentation. We are going to let Brian take it from here. And as you all know, you all received this agenda. This is what we're going to be talking about in all three phases. Please, please make sure to type your questions in the chat box. We are going to read them and we're going to make sure that you get an answer for them. So without further ado, Brian, the floor is yours. 
Great, thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Brian Johnson. Uh, I'm with the QAD Architecture um, Design Division. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, the architecture staff at QAD, it's myself, uh, Rufino Martinez, Eric Urias, Raul Carasqual, Michael Lotus Poto, and Mariano Vidal. Um, we review the, the, the plans you'll be submitting to us, and this is the team you'll be dealing with. Uh, next slide, please. So QAD reviews to confirm that design complies, complies with code requirements, including uh, life safety, fire safety, and accessibility. Uh, we'll review conceptual designs and provide guidance, but we only recommend uh, approval for construction when the uh, drawings are signed and sealed by the architect and engineer licensed in the state where the project occurs. Uh, that's important. The uh, the architect or uh, the engineer is responsible for the design. We perform a design audit, uh, but obviously the architect needs to be licensed and the engineer needs to be licensed in the state where the work is occurring. Next slide, please. Okay, now why why we review for code? Um, so two examples. So if some of you may remember in the Bronx, there was a, an, a, an apartment a fire, apartment building fire in 2022 uh, with 17 fatalities. Um, the fire started at the bottom floor of the lower floor, maybe at the second or third floor, the bottom uh, band. Um, and then it spread the it's, it, it spread throughout the building, but in, and honestly, the it wasn't so much the fire. The fire stayed was relatively contained. It was the smoke. Um, and unfortunately, there were 17 fatalities up where those those floors are at the top. Uh, people died on those floors, uh, and it was all smoke inhalation. Uh, the fire never got up there; it was smoke inhalation. And the primary uh, failure that caused not not caused the fire, but caused it to be so um, so deadly was door hardware. Uh, the 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 door to the apartment didn't close like it was supposed to. It didn't latch. That let the smoke out into the the main hallway. Um, then the door to the to the stairwell didn't close and latch properly and let smoke into the stairwell, and then it was just a chimney. It kind of went up through the building, and then unfortunately on other floors up above, again, the hardware didn't fail uh, also, and then the smoke got out onto those floors as well. Um, so it's, it seems like it's a small detail, but it, 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 it's an important detail. Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, fire, this was, some of you may recall, uh, this was in West London, the Grenfell Tower uh, fire in 2017. And there were 72 fatalities. Uh, now, in this case, the, the 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 reason why this got so bad was was multiple things. Uh, they clad the building in in a combustible cladding. Uh, and then there were either issues with how they installed the fire blocking or or how they designed it. Um, but basically, the, the there was a fire in one of the lower apartments. It spread out on the window. It got the cladding on fire. And then because of the gap between the the cladding and the main building. And either improper fire stopping, uh, fire blocking in the cavity, or uh, improper design, uh, basically created a chimney effect. If any of you ever had a campfire, the heat goes up, it draws air from the bottom, and it just went right up the side of the building. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, you can see the fire actually once it once it got out on the outside of the building, it climbed and it went throughout the building. So in the previous example was the smoke. In this case, it was obviously the smoke as well, but the fire actually spread. So. You know, most of the Port Authority facilities were type one and two buildings, so it's non combustible construction. You can see these buildings that they, they didn't, there was no structural collapse. The building stayed, the construction type did what it was supposed to, but because of the details of it, they still had some very fatal fires. Uh, and so it's the, the details that we'll look on, on on finishes, as we'll, we'll speak about later, uh, become very important. Uh, next slide, please. So QAD reviews uh, the adopted building uh, to the uh, the adopted local building codes, whether you're in New York or New Jersey, and also the Port Authority Tenant Construction Review Manual. Uh, it is a collaborative review process. The team that you that I mentioned in the first slide, uh, we work together. Uh, we'll we'll um, you know to make sure we're we're reviewing the things. Uh, you know we'll run questions past each other if we have a question. Uh, we vet the comments amongst each other, so we make sure that the comments going out are saying exactly what needs to be said, so it's clear and concise. And we'll also, and the dispositions we'll give are either conceptual reviews, which are for guidance, a disapprove where there's something significantly long that might require a redesign, conditionally approved where the the uh, the comments need to be resolved, but you can start construction, or full full approval when there's the um, no comments at all, and that that is obviously the the, the desired outcome. Next slide, please. So what we review against uh, the standards we review against in New Jersey, it's the 2021 International Building Code, New Jersey edition, uh, also the Uniform Construction Code. In New York City, it's the 2022 New York City Building Code, as well as the 2014 New York City Building Code, if the application was submitted before November 7th. So if an application was already submitted and it's under construction, you, you can continue under the 2014. Any new applications are following the 2022 New York City Building Code. 
Um, they're, they're all 2022 New York City Building Code applications. Under certain conditions, the, 2020, the administrative code will allow you to use the 1968 code with certain exceptions. There are about 20 exceptions. So if you do meet those exceptions and you're in an existing building, uh, there's an option to use the 68 code under certain conditions. Uh, New York State, will, we're using the, uh, the 2020 International Building Code. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, uh, just a sample review of something we might look at. Uh, it's kind of a, a typical office floor. Uh, it's a business occupancy on the 45th floor. It's got three tenants, a core with uh, two exit stairs, elevators, pantry, and restrooms. And next slide, please. So the occupant load, you can add up those three tenants. It's 128 people. Uh, the code would require two exits for that occupant load, and we have two stairs. Next slide, please. For tenant one, uh, the occupant load is 49 people. Um, so the number of exits that are required from that space would be one. Uh, in New Jersey, if you have less than 50, you can have uh, only one exit. In, in New York City, I believe it's uh, 75. Uh, but in either case, the space itself can have a single means of egress, so that would be compliant. Next slide, please. So uh, if you look at the uh, slide here, we're on the 45th floor. now. Uh, the, because the 45th floor would make this a high rise building, the building code requires that uh, the floor be the elevator elevators be protected with an elevator lobby. Uh, in this case, there is no elevator lobby. Uh, the, the purpose of the elevator lobby is, if you remember from the previous slides, is very important to make sure that if smoke does get in from into the elevator shaft from a lower floor, that it doesn't spread throughout the, the upper floors. If it did get up in that shaft, theoretically, the smoke will be contained in the elevator lobby and not spread onto the floor. Next slide, please. So another issue that this creates is even if you put in the elevator lobby in this design, you'd still be you'd still have not that would create a non-compliant egress situation because as the, as designed right here, both stairs off the floor have to to get to them. You have to go through the elevator lobby. So if that elevator lobby is is uh, filled with smoke, both stairs become non-accessible, and that that would be a code violation. Right, next slide, please. Another issue is the location of stairs one and two in this in this design. Um, the the code requires that for all buildings, if if you have two stair if you have any if you have stair enclosure that share a common wall, floor, or ceiling, even if they're two separate stairs, they're considered a single exit enclosure for purposes of the code. Uh, the idea being that if somehow that wall got compromised in some way, you'd lose both stairs simultaneously. Uh, in addition, uh, section four hundred three is specific for high rise. Uh, high rise buildings have additional requirements where those stairs have to be separated even further. Uh, I believe it's uh, a third of the diagonal of the, or 30 feet or a quarter of the diagonal of the floor. Uh, so as a high rise building, those two stairs are too close to each other. Next slide, please. Another issue in this plan would be the design of, the, of this corridor here. It creates a dead end condition going to the restrooms. Uh, the code would allows a maximum of 20 feet for a dead end. Uh, there are certain uh, ex uh, extensions permitted when the building sprinklered. Uh, but, but in general, you want to avoid a condition where someone has to go down a corridor. Uh, if they went down that corridor and then had to go back to find a stair, that's a dead end condition and the code limits how far those can go. Next slide, please. Okay, so over at tenant, uh, tenant number two, you'll see that uh, we're saying that there's a, a non compliant condition where tenant two only has a single means of egress. Uh, and if you look at the occupant load, it's 49 people. You might ask, well, tenant one has 49 people. It was, it was okay for them. Why is it not okay for tenant two? Uh, but you also notice there's a room over on the right that has another 30 people. So when you have a condition like that where, you know, rooms open up on each other, you have to you have to add the occupant loads together. You add them together, you're at 79 people. Then the code requires two independent exits out of tenant two. So not only do you need two independent exits off the floor, you also need two independent exits out of the tenant space itself. Uh, next slide, please. So in this case, uh, also you see over at tenant number three, uh, they have 30 people, so a single exit is fine, but you'll notice the way this is designed right now, they have to cross tenant two to reach the exit. Uh, that's not permitted by code. Uh, you can't have one tenant go through another, ten another tenant space to, to reach an exit. Uh, so the way that that would be, probably you'd resolve this is by extending that uh, central corridor over to tenant number three so that each tenant has access to the public corridor. Uh, next slide, please. So, We'll, we'll review for egress. Uh, one of the things we we'll review is travel distances. Uh, tra the, the length of travel distance you're allowed is based on the uh, use group and whether or not the building's sprinklered. So if you're in an office area setting, for instance, where you're more familiar with where the exits are, the occupant load's a little bit lower, you get longer travel distances compared to like a place of assembly where you might have a lot of people, they're not familiar where the exits are, those distances are shorter. 
And then in any occupancy, if sprinklers are included, you get extensions and travel distances because of the protection that the sprinkler system offers. Uh, for exits, uh, the three parts of the exits are the access, the exit itself, and the exit discharge. Uh, the access will be that portion of the uh, exit that we measure travel distance in. Essentially, it gets you from the occupied area to the fire-rated exit enclosure. Uh, the exit is, the, is that fire-rated exit enclosure. Uh, theoretically, when you're in that exit, you are protected from any hazards on the floor. And then there's the discharge where you actually leave the building itself. Uh, typically, that is to a public way, but in certain conditions at the Port Authority, such as at the airports, uh, where you might be discharging onto the airside ramp where the aircraft are, that is not a public way. And then there are additional requirements to make sure that the people exiting the building uh, are exiting safely. Uh, doors and hardware, uh, as we mentioned, we'll review for the for the the hardware on the doors. If panic hardware is needed, uh, make sure that the fire doors latch and close with closers. Uh, again, very important. You can see from those fires that just a small thing, such as a door hardware, can lead to fatalities if it's not if if it's not installed or maintained correctly. Uh, exit signs. If if for any reason the exits are not immediately visible, you need additional exit signs to point uh, directional exit signs to point to where they are. Uh, stair capacities are based on the width of the stair uh, uh, multiplied by a factor, and then depending on that width, it'll that'll determine how many people can can be in that space. Uh, and elevator lobbies, we already spoke about the importance of those before to prevent fires from, from moving up through the floors, uh, smoke really, from moving up between the floors of a building. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so another thing we'll review is for, for fire separation and fire prevention. Uh, flammability of interior finishes is something we'll look for. As I mentioned before, uh, the what the most of our buildings are non-combustible construction, so they're probably not going to burn down in their entirety. But you, but depending on the finishes you put in there, you can create a lot of smoke and smoke smoke kills. So, the code uh, prescribes what kind of finishes are allowed based on the use group that you that you're using, whether it's business or office or mercantile or whatever it might be, and also whether or not there's a sprinkler system. Uh, again, uh, the idea being that a sprinkler system is going to be able to contain and control that fire. So um, you might be able to have uh, more um, finishes with a, a lesser fire rating because of the sprinkler system. Uh, fire ratings and separation of occupancies, uh, depending on the type of use that's going on in the building, the building may need to be subdivided uh, with fire rated construction uh, to separate the different uses. Uh, penetrations, when you do have fire rated construction, whether it be by floor or by tenant separation or whatever it might be, uh, the penetrations through there, we will review for that to make sure that, excuse me, uh, to make sure that the, oh, sorry, I'm getting a call here. Um, uh, sorry, uh, to, make, to make sure that the um, the penetrations are not, um, th there's no way that smoke can get through the, the fire rated construction. Uh, storage and use of hazardous material. Um, believe it or not, there are actually quite a, uh, we have facilities that, that do actually, uh, we will deal with hazardous material. Um, with with uh, the airports, we have aviation fuel, we have maintenance facilities, things like that. So um, whether or not, we'll deal with the flammability of the substance and the material, the allowable quantities, There'll, there'll be uh, hazardous material reports and also the, the use group classification. So just because you have a hazardous material doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna, going to have to classify yourself as a high hazard. Uh, you are allowed to have certain quantities and still be uh, the, your main use group. However, once you get over a certain amount of material, uh, then you're going to get, trigger a high hazard classification, which has additional and, and probably the most stringent requirements in the building code to protect um, you know, the people and, and also the building containing those hazards. Uh, next slide, please. For accessibility, uh, there is the, the federal ADA, which is a civil rights law, as well as the local accessibility codes. Uh, QAD reviewed for the local accessibility codes, and we uh, enforce that. Uh, the federal ADA is a civil, like I said, is a civil rights law. So, amongst other things, they do have requirements for the built environment, but there's also a lot more involved with it. So we do require the standard ADA note that says that the architect is certifying that the design complies with the uh, with the federal uh, civil rights law, but then also will review for the local accessibility codes, which while they're very similar between them, uh, the there are differences between them, and in many cases the local codes uh, will could have more stringent requirements than the federal. Uh, as an example, um, for parking, the ADA, when you get to parking spaces, the ADA typically has a, a chart that says it's about, works out to about 2% of the spaces need to be accessible. Um, and then, but if you were in New York City, the requirement is 5%. So we will, we would enforce the, the 5%. Uh, 
uh, counter heights, there are requirements that you have, depending on whether it's a, a self-service counter or a food service counter, depending on what it is, those heights have to be met so that it's accessible. And also the restrooms, I won't go into all those details, but there are a lot of dimensional requirements for the restrooms to make sure that both the lavatories and the water closets and, all, and the, uh, the approaches, that they all meet those requirements for people that uh, may need to use wheelchairs. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing we'll review for is energy code and green roofs. Uh, for the energy code, well, there's a, we need we'll review for an energy analysis. It will cover the building envelope, mechanical and water heating equipment, as well as lighting and power. Uh, it's typically uh, reviewed through a com check calculation, uh, which can be done online, and, it'll, and you'll, you'll basically certify, demonstrate using that program that you meet the energy code requirements. And then, specifically to New York City, uh, under, under local law of uh, 9294 of 2019. That requires a vegetative roof and solar panels to be installed on all new roofs and um, renovations that involve replacing of existing roof decks. That's now part of the 2022 New York City Building Code in the section that's there. Uh, when we're saying replacing uh, roof uh, roofing, that's not that's not a roof replacement project. Just so there's some confusion about it sometimes. So if you're replacing the membrane, that doesn't mean you're going to have to install a, a green roof. But if you're going down to the to the actual deck structure and and replacing some of that structure, uh, that would need to be evaluated at that point as well as any addition onto a building that's considered a new roof and that would that portion would have to comply. Uh, next slide, please. So another thing we'll review for is flood zone compliance. Uh, this picture here is not far from our facilities at Brooklyn Piers. Uh, this is, I think, in, in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Uh, next slide, please. So for flood zone compliance uh, in New York State and New Jersey uh, versus New York City, um, for New York, New York State and New Jersey use the IBC and they'll reference um, 2414 uh, for in, in, which deals with new construction, substantial improvements and substantially damaged. Now substantial improvements and substantial damage, they have to do with the value of the building uh, based on the scope of work that you're doing. Uh, so if basically if you're crossing 50%, if your work is essentially crossing 50% of the value or more than 50% of the value of the structure, uh, you're going to trigger compliance. Uh, there are different flood zones based on the severity of the storm surge, which is often governed by the proximity to the water bodies, which kind of makes sense. The closer you are to the water, the worse the flood zone, the more restrictive there are requirements. Uh, AC 2414 generally requires structures to be elevated above the flood elevation at the Port Authority because of our location to the water. Um, but there are provisions to allow for uh, dry flood proofing under certain conditions. Um, and then there are provisions for protecting electrical, plumbing, and fuel and utilities that are located below the flood elevation, uh, which serve those buildings that are in the flood zone. Uh, next slide, please. In New York City, uh, they also use ASE 24, but they also have Appendix G, which uh, um, enhances and modifies uh, the standard uh, flood uh, ASE 24 significantly. Uh, New York City, it, it applies to new construction, substantial improvements, um, but it, it, uh, as well. But there's also requirements for horizontal enlargements. So if you put an addition onto an existing building, that addition has to comply with the flood code, regardless of whether or not the existing building does. That's different than New Jersey. Um, and New York City also has requirements for alterations that increase the degree of noncompliance in existing buildings. So if you have an existing building um, and you want to change the use of it, depending on what that change of use might be, that could uh, possibly uh, trigger a noncompliance issue, which may or may not be permitted. And also a lot of times finishes. Uh, if you have a space that's subject to flooding uh, and let's say it, it's, it's uh, you know, just a concrete shell, uh, you, you will not be permitted to put in finishes that would be considered uh, non-flood resistant, whether that be carpet or chipboard or whatever that might be, that might have to be just thrown out after a flood condition. So something to keep in mind. Uh, the New York City Building Code generally permits structures to be located below the flood elevation, provided that the buildings are flood proofed. Um, now, a dry flood proof to prevent water from entering. Now, when, you, when we have those conditions, we require certification from the design professional uh, that identifies the compliance path that was um, provided and the certification that it meets those requirements, uh, whether it be wet flood proofing, dry flood proofing. Uh, QED is not going to review the details per se, that all the details will, um, will be uh, flood proof. We rely on that certification, but we will, uh, ask, we will ask the AOR to confirm what that path is and you know when we have doors and openings things like that we will ask for the details of how those openings are protected uh we have there new york city also has requirements to maintain egress under flood conditions uh so it, it, you if you're putting in flood logs and things like that there you may have to put in temporary stairs to get up and over the flood logs um you also might not be able to, to lock the you know put the flood 
logs in such a way that you can't exit through from the building. And then it also like New Jersey, there are provisions for protecting the electrical plumbing and fuel and utilities below the flood elevation. Next slide, please. For temporary construction, um, temporary construction is something that we, we deal with a lot here. Uh, there's a time duration limitation in New York City. That's 90 days and in New Jersey, it's 180 days. Um, when you're, when you're, uh, if your project's going to, if the build, if the structure's going to be there longer than that time frame, then it's considered permanent construction. However, even if it's temp temporary construction, there are still requirements for life safety, fire safety, health, which is sanitary and accessibility. So there's, it doesn't mean that there are no requirements. There are still significant requirements that we'll review for, uh, trailers when they're occupied by people, trailers are considered buildings and must comply with building code. So, um, you know, when you get when you if you're purchasing a, a, a trailer and you bring it on site, uh, there are building code requirements for that. Um, we consider them, like I said, a modular building. And for when it comes to modular buildings, uh, those drawings are required to be signed and sealed by a licensed architect in the state in which the buildings are installed. So sometimes we'll get those trailers that are uh, in we, a lot of times they come from the south, um, and they'll be signed and sealed by the by the um, by the engineer that designed it. But we need someone that's licensed in the state where it's being installed uh, to sign and seal those. Uh, in addition, there are site specific requirements uh, on those tra for those trailers. So the trailer itself might be code compliant, but then in terms of the site, we'll need to review the foundation, its proximity to adjacent buildings, accessibility. Very th there are a number of site specific conditions that also need to be addressed when you're dealing with modular buildings. Uh, in New Jersey, the, the, there's also a modular building certification that could be by a state agency or by the Industrial Buildings Commission. Um, but again, site site specific uh, installation must be demonstrated to be code compliant as well. Next slide, please. So the keys to this is, is to ensure that the application documentation is complete prior to submitting. Uh, that's very important because if it becomes incomplete or not quite there, QED is going to make a bunch of comments. You'll have to respond to those comments. We'll have to respond to the responses and it'll just slow things down. So to just make the application as, as complete as you can when you first submit it to us. Um, when that's done, we can absolutely work closely with the design team to resolve comments quickly. Uh, the goal must always be to achieve full approval and condition approval should only be granted on an as need basis under unusual circumstances. Um, our goal is to get full approval as, as quickly as possible for you so you can build. Uh, we don't we don't want to be in your way and we don't we you, you guys know how how to do your design. We, we want to just make sure it's co-compliant and then you know you're on your way. So that's our goal. And then there's a, a dedicated project management team that will, is, will be available, excuse me, available to you to review and, and assist in the best way possible. So when you submit to us, uh, we'll have a, a project management team on our side that you'll be able to, uh, through, the, through the facility, be able to reach out to us and, and, and get in touch with us for any questions you might need. Next slide, please. So our review process, we have conceptual and preliminary reviews. Those are high level audits, kind of like the 30, 60, 90% uh, level. And those are there to find the showstoppers. We're not going to give you all the details, all the detailed comments, but if there's anything significant that might require a redesign, that's where we try to flag it as early as possible uh, so that uh, it can be addressed before the construction documents get too far developed. Um, once you receive comments from us, there's also an interim audit process. Uh, those are expedited reviews. We can work through the comments efficiently and effectively, and we'll actually hold the disposition, like the formal disposition, until we achieve uh, no further comments. Uh, and it, it's it's sort of a way to kind of help to speed things along if that's something you'd, you'd like to, um, to 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 partake of. Uh, so rather than having to go through that formal process of submitting all the forms and doing all those things, uh, we can work quickly with you to try to get those comments closed. Uh, next comment, uh, next slide, please. So key takeaways: QED's goal is to facilitate safe facilities and successful construction projects, but we can only achieve this when our, ourselves, the facility, and the design team work together as a team to identify and resolve the issues. Uh, we protect the public by ensuring compliance with life safety requirements. Uh, we protect the port authority by minimizing liability for non-code compliant conditions, and we also protect the architect, architect and engineer by identifying any potential code deficiencies so they can be corrected prior to signing off on the job. And I think with that, that's my time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, please make sure you are typing your questions in the chat box and uh, we will make sure to read them. We'll have, oh, let me just take it. Brian, you have a few questions um, from Clay Gallagher. 
So what is the difference between a TAA and an MWA? Oh, okay, so this is more for us. And then when does a project exceed minor work status? Um, we're looking to install electrical vehicle charging stations, which seems like it would be a tenant alteration, but not sure if what type of work requires a TAA or an MWA. Uh, so Ryan, you want me, want me to try to handle that or? No, we, we can do that. I really okay, will answer it. that question. Thank you. I, I will answer it at the end of the presentation. So, because it's not really, uh, and anything that is code related, code compliance issues uh, will have to go through the TAA process. The minor work application is reserved for the uh, uh, replacement in kind. Um, so, let me just, I'll pull up the uh, chart and we'll show you in details at the end of the presentation. Correct. Okay, let's continue on. Um, please type your questions in the chat box and we will make sure to read them um, once our presenters are done to answer them appropriately. If not at the end, um, we will stop the recording so that you can open up your mics and ask the questions directly to them as well too. So Carmela, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and thank you, Brian. Um, you've done a diligent job in outlining the expectations in the design from a design perspective and uh, that could hopefully lead the team to a conditional approval or what we recommend highly is a full design approval. The resident engineer's office plays a critical role throughout the TCAP process. Uh, so once we get that either conditional approval or full design approval, we become the primary point of contact from uh, construction to pre-construction meeting to close out. Go to the next slide. Yes, I'm gonna go there, thanks. So I want to um, continue, I'm sorry. So once we get uh, to that conditional approval, thank you, I was just gonna say next slide, please. We're gonna outline the roles and responsibilities of the resident engineer's office. So we are a critical part of the process. We are the primary point from the pre-con to close out. Um, we are a partner throughout the process with the various stakeholders, as well as the Port Authority facilities and the coordination of any kind of utility yeah, I, I shutdown. Thank you. Any field concerns that should arise, we are the lead. Our goal is to get the tenant team to a successful project closeout. Um, I'm going to pass the slide in the presentation over to Dan so he can continue the uh, roles and responsibilities of the resident engineer's office. and. Um, Look forward to any questions that you may have. Dan, please. Good afternoon, everybody. So moving on to the responsibilities of the REO, we audit and monitor the tenants, contractor, and the AEOR for conformance with the PA approved contract documents, specs, permits, and any applicable codes. And of course, adherence to the TCAP procedures. So this includes QA, QC, uh, safety or HAS plans, um, compliance with special inspections, verifying mis uh, material certifications, and uh, compliance with uh, field change protocols. I would like to just in, in, you know, emphasize that we are, the resident engineer's office are the boots in the ground, on the ground, where they are day-to-day -day monitoring the tenant's contractor and the activities in the field. So the expectation is that we're a partner any issues that come out in the field, we're there to assist. Continue, Dan. REO will confirm by verifying in the field that the work being requested by the AEOR is complete prior to scheduling a PA inspection. We will coordinate and schedule the inspections once the work areas are complete. We review the AEOR certification request packages and any supporting documentation uh, for completeness, and this includes special inspection reports, any uh, test reports, and uh, all the AEOR certification documentation, which we'll get, uh, we'll move into later on. The REO issues inspection minutes after each inspection, noting all the deficiencies and verifies, tracks and verifies that all the deficiencies are resolved. And we will process all the required documentation to the 10 coordinator for issuance of a temporary or final 
certificate of authorization to occupy. So during the design phase, we're um, we're trying to uh, ensure that the the design is put together in such a way that it becomes a phase construction. So the request for a temporary certificate of authorization use is already by design approved on, on the initial uh, design submission process before it gets to pre-con. So the, so the milestones are already set. So it simplifies the process of achieving the goal for occupancy as per the tenant's request. Please continue. Move to the next slide, please. So to add to your point, Carmel, about the design, the, the goal of the design phase is to develop a complete design that's code compliant. And one of the one of the ways that we do this is that the tenant and the AEOR must conduct a site visit prior to the contract document submission. And the purpose is to identify existing conditions, both above, below, and on site. The items that they would look for on the site visit include egress space, any obstructions, access to nearby utilities and tie-in locations, and presence of hazardous materials. So the REO actually reviews the contract drawings. We look for constructability and to get an understanding of the scope of work. Some of the items that we look for include partition types and fire ratings. So all proposed and existing partitions within the scope of or limits of work should be identified as fire rated or not, and what that rating is. And it's important to know that while you're designing a rated wall uh, where another tenant is occupying the adjacent space, that also should be uh, reviewed and vetted to make sure that that rated wall assembly is properly designed. So don't just look in your, in your area. Sometimes it affects the adjacent area too. So that's critical. And we find that um, uh, numerous times to be a nonconformance later on during inspections. Please continue. Right, so we look for completeness of the drawing. So all the details for each condition, this includes all partitions and ceiling types, top and bottom of the wall details, a detail for fire, all types of fire resistant joints and penetrations. It's not a one size fits all. So the different types of uh, fire resistant joints and penetrations should each have their own detail in the drawings and they should be UL listed details. And any unique conditions should also be identified in the drawings. So this would include existence of expansion joints, any large ductwork that could become an, an obstruction in the field, or any openings through the floor. Um, we also look to see that all the emergency lighting is identified. Egress paths and widths should also be identified, uh, and signage as well. All required special inspections should be listed on the drawings and it should match the special inspections checklist submitted by the design professional prior to the pre-con. The REO will monitor all design comments until they're resolved. And we recommend that the AUR identify in the design phase if the tenant is envisioning to do a phase occupancy so that we can prepare and plan for it later on. And the goal is to receive a no further comment design determination prior to the pre-construction meeting. And the reason why the no further comments is so important is because the work is considered work at risk when it goes into construction. So if the contractor, the general contractor is performing work on uh, open rider comments, it becomes work at risk. And should any deviation from what they're building in the field changes from the actual resubmission and approval of that element of work, we are not gonna schedule any inspections until that rework is complete to match the approved drawings. So I just wanna emphasize the importance of getting to that no further comments versus doing non-conformance work. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide, thanks. Moving on to construction or phase two. So while the uh, design documents are still being reviewed, we can actually, as soon as a contract is identified, we can begin working on putting together the pre-construction documents that are required for a meeting. Um, in order to, to schedule a pre-con, all the pre-con documents must be received and approved, and the design must reach at least a conditional approval. 
the pre-con discussion, topics of discussion will include any open rider comments and a path to no further comment. The general contractor's schedule where we'll review milestones, any critical inspections, um, grand openings. and any grand openings, go live dates, we'll review uh, permits for the uh, construction scope of work, required special inspections, any operational requirements or coordination with the facility. Uh, we'll go over site-specific safety plans, the AEOR and contractor responsibilities and expectations, if there's a change to the design professional throughout the process, and we'll also review the inspection process to successfully achieve closeout. And I can't stress enough that the AEOR is ultimately responsible for the TAA, and so at the pre-con, uh, we allow them to discuss the scope of work, any critical elements of construction. We should review the inspection strategy and if there's any phase occupancy. And the AUR is 100% responsible for the work and inspections. If there's a complex project that may require multiple inspections, we can schedule at the tenant's request an inspection process meeting where we would get all the PA groups together and review the expectations and requirements of each inspection. So consider fire alarm tests, any, um, if there's a, a food or health safety inspection required for any concessions, uh, these are all, or vertical transportation, these are all um, inspections that, that we'd be able to schedule a meeting to review. Uh, construction progress. Once the construction actually starts, the AUR is expected to ensure that all the elements of work are complete prior to requesting an inspection. The REO simply monitors and audits all of the field work, including the third-party special inspections and building system tests. The REO will also verify all materials used on site match the PA approved contract drawings. So this can include checking the gauge sizes on metal framing and seismic splay wires, verifying gypsum board uh, for um, to be moisture resistant, fire res resistant, all lumber should be fire retardant and include the fire retardant marking indicating such. The code base should match the uh, proof detail. FRP wall panels typically to be installed in any kitchens and tempered glass. And these are just some examples of uh, what types of materials we look for on site. And I would like to add that although the REO, we monitor the field work, it is ultimately at the discretion of the tenant and their engineer record to be engaged in the field as often as they see necessary to ensure that the third party is performing their, their special inspections, that the work is being performed in accordance to those approved, Port Authority approved drawings. REO's role is to monitor it. Engineer records role is 100% responsibility of the work. I just wanna reemphasize that. And with that being said, we also ensure that all work is complete, matching the latest PA approved drawings, and it should be free of any deficiencies prior to re requesting an official PA audit inspection. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, first and foremost, all work is to be installed as per the PA approved contract drawings. Um, with that being said, in Oreo's experience, we're gonna go over, we put together a compressed list of typical architectural deficiencies that we typically see in the field. So this can include compromised or incomplete fire stopping assemblies. As mentioned, each fire stopping assembly should, cor uh, should correspond to an approved detail on the drawings, and it should be a UL listed fire stopping detail. Sometimes in the field, if I, I'll give you an example, if there's an electrical conduit running through a fire rated wall, um, a, lot of, a lot of times, people might see red and think that the fire stopping is complete. But again, we have to make sure that the, we have to make sure that the installed uh, condition matches the detail. So that might include uh, installing a sleeve and fire stopping inside of that sleeve. Um, if the work is ongoing and somebody bumps into it, it could become disturbed or compromised. So making sure that the inspections are done at the completion of all work Staggering of gypsum board seams and installation of control joints at fire rated walls 
Oftentimes this is something that's mentioned in the specs, but it may not be included in the contract drawings. Nonetheless, it's a requirement. And uh, this is very critical, especially at fire rated walls to maintain the integrity of those walls. Sprayed fire resistant material or sometimes known as uh, spray and fireproofing on steel requires patching wherever it's disturbed. So on a lot of tenant fit outs where we're installing new duct work or pipes in the ceiling, if we're supporting off of existing steel and that fire stopping, uh, that fireproofing is disturbed, it must be patched and reinspected. Fire rated doors and frames not installed at rated partitions or missing fire rated labels on doors and frames. Those labels should be uh, visible and not to be painted over. All lumber on site to be fire retardant. Door hardware missing. This includes door sweeps, astragals, door closers, and egress hardware. Spacing of ceiling grid supports spaced too far and missing seismic splay wires. As I mentioned, if sometimes you're not able to meet that maximum support spacing because of uh, a large duct which is causing you to span too, too far, then there should be a detail for that of sizing up the um, uh, sizing up the support so that it's able to span that, that distance. Um, bracing of non-bearing walls and partial height walls. Flooring to be level and pose no tripping hazards. Compliance with all ADA requirements. This includes ramp slopes, handrails, travel widths, heights of wall-mounted devices, overhead clearances, and any protruding objects. Egress deficiencies, making sure that there's a clear path to egress. All exit signage and emergency lighting is installed and coordination with security doors so you don't get locked on the way out. And I do wanna emphasize that um, it becomes a challenge when we have security requirements and egress requirements on you know, door openings, what needs to be um, the egress path that it's clearly unlocked and free, free flowing. And uh, at times we see that uh, that's missed in the field. So just understand that egress trumps security. So take that into consideration when you're designing and you have these two elements that um, this is properly coordinated. Next slide, please. Moving on to field conditions and scope changes. Field conditions should be captured during the design phase via the AEUR site visit. During construction, the REO must be kept in the loop if there's any field conditions that would or a scope change. The resident engineer will determine the path to capture the conditions, whether that's via scope change or capturing the changes in an as-built. And typically for fire, life safety, or code-related items, the AEUR will submit an official scope change. And for minor field conditions, the revisions may be reflected on as well drawings with REO concurrence. Again, just to reemphasize, it is the RE's office, the resident engineer, that determines the path to capture the condition. So if it's structural, fire life safety, egress code, it needs to be officially submitted as a scope change. And the tenant coordinator is a, a plays a, a key role in assisting the RE and the designers to make that submission uh, to QAD for additional review. Again, it's not a long period of time. It's not a long duration for the review, depending on the change. But, you know, I know in the past, they've really been diligent in expediting and helping, helping resolve these issues. So it doesn't hold back any official milestone or inspections that are, are required. So let's not wait for the last minute to identify it. Let's try and catch it earlier on if they're is a need for a scope change. Next slide, please. Moving on to AEOR certification requests for partial or final inspections, phase three. Port Authority inspections are scheduled by the resident engineer's office through a receipt of AEOR signed and sealed certification requests. The certification requests must be reviewed and approved by the resident engineer's office prior to scheduling an inspection. No inspections will be conducted on scopes of work with open design comments or where the installations don't match the latest PA approved drawings. I'd like to emphasize that 
one more time. So we will not schedule any inspections if there are open rider comments related to that scope of work or installation that deviates from the latest PA approved drawings. So it's to everyone's benefit to get through a full design approval and identify field conditions earlier on to not impede in this inspection request. The architect or engineer of record and contractor personnel must be present to conduct the inspection. This includes having appropriate subcontractors on site to operate, test, or demonstrate any systems required for the inspection and providing the appropriate equipment, tools, laterals uh, to provide access to the area. And just to emphasize that the, if the engineer record cannot be present, they can designate uh, an appropriate um, engineer that is qualified or competent in the in the elements of work that's being requested in the inspection. So if you're doing a fire alarm test, I wouldn't expect someone that wouldn't be uh, of complete understanding of that system. That person should be designated to come out in the field and conduct the inspection. So the resident engineer's office will be on site to coordinate, but it's the engineer of record that leads the inspection with our Port Authority um, stakeholders. So it's important that they fully understand the scope of work that is being requested under this inspection and to properly demonstrate it for a successful inspection. What I also recommend is there are many of times when the engineer or their designee do not have the necessary documentations to support that inspection. And what I mean by that is an approved shop drawing that possibly shows all the seismic bracing or um, design of a rated wall that you could easily flip through on a drawing or some test result that pertains to that scope of uh, being inspected that could be pulled up. The goal is not to have deficiencies noted to address and be prepared for each of the inspections. That is the win. Very good. And at the conclusion of each inspection, REL will review the, the deficiencies generated in the, during the inspection with all the attendees and official inspection minutes will be distributed. Next slide, please. So AEOR certification requests for partial or final inspections consist of the following items. An AOR cover letter to request a partial or a final inspection. A PH212 for a partial inspection or a PH314 for a final inspection as, a, as applicable. Um, a sketch showing the area being certified. Um, if, if the portion of work being certified can be explained and identified in the contract drawings, then a sketch may not be required. And if a sketch is included, it should have a sketch number, a unique sketch number, the TAA number and title included, a date, a legend identifying the area or the scopes of work being certified, and the AEOR professional seal and signature. A special inspections checklist should be provided with all the applicable special inspection reports and test results. Record drawings are required for a final inspection. Next slide. We're gonna go over the difference between a partial inspection and a final inspection and, and when to use each one. A final inspection is used when all of the work for the entire TAA is complete, while a partial inspection is used when all of the work in a specific area is complete. So for a partial inspection, sketches can be used to outline the scope of work or area being certified, and it's not required if it can be clearly identified. And this would be helpful when we have an approved design by phased construction. So if you're calling out for a partial inspection of a specific area and it's called phase one, for example, we would only, we wouldn't need a sketch. Your PH212 would be as simple as all work related to phase one. So that phase one as approved on the drawings would encompass all that work. It'd be very straightforward and simple. And we highly recommend that the design follow a phase construction to close out. Exactly. And a partial inspection can be one of two types. It can either be for occupancy or not for occupancy. So a partial inspection not for occupancy 
is used when a partial inspection or an inspection is required for an area that's going to be that where you're going to lose access. So think of an in wall inspection or an above ceiling. Um, these are all areas that have to be inspected for the closeout of the project, but you may not be requesting uh, occupancy of a space, whereas a partial inspection for occupancy is when beneficial use is requested. And again, this should be identified in the design phasing plans. So think of a TAA where you have two separate rooms and one is ready while the other is still under construction. You would call for a partial inspection for occupancy for the one room. Required documents at the PA inspection, as Carmela noted, the AEOR should be prepared to provide the latest PA approved contract drawings, any RFI submittal shop drawings, um, which should all be available for review during the inspections. Next slide, please. So lastly, we just wanna review the key takeaways and the tips for success. So in the design phase, we always wanna strive for full design approval prior to the pre-con, which will avoid field issues or delays in scheduling PA inspections later on in the project. We recommend that the REO performs an on-site walkthrough as the design is under review to ensure that no glaring work scope is missed. We're familiar with the area and um, and this would help with um, also the engineer record, although the REO does perform these on-site walkthroughs in advance while the design is still taking shape, um, it is a requirement also in the TCAP that the engineer record, as we mentioned earlier in the slides, also do a walkthrough. So it does capture all these elements of work that may be missed uh, that we may find when we do our on-site work walkthrough earlier on. So these are the key takeaways and success to a full design approval to try and avoid any kind of scope changes. Exactly. And communication is the number one key to success. So keeping the REO informed of any field issues or scope changes is highly recommended. REO pre-inspections and pre-testing uh, of various systems egress, emergency light testing, prior to an official PA audit inspection is key to making sure we pass on the first try. And again, this is highly recommended, um, ensuring that the engineer record or designee, as well as your third party special inspection uh, agency representative is on site to witness these pre-inspections and the pre-testing as, as they're required. Um, it leads again to a successful Port Authority audit uh, again it's 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 just a, a it, time saving for everyone and uh, it addresses any preliminary failures up front uh, and, and it could be isolated so that's another key takeaway and planning lastly planning ahead we want to make sure that advance notice is provided for upcoming tenant milestones and PA inspection requests which is why it's critical to identify any phase construction during the design phase and to have a fully comprehensive schedule from the general contractor prior to the pre-construction meeting where we would identify upcoming tests, inspections, and again, key milestones. And we also recommend that the AEOR provides draft certification request packages for REO review so that by the time we're ready for an inspection, all the paperwork has been reviewed and ready for official uh, submission. Thank you. Um, uh, Ryan, um, I'm not sure if there's any questions, but, uh, see any questions in the chat box. I hope people are preparing them, um, answer towards the end over here. Uh, Jamal, you can take it over and then we'll make sure to open that sec that Q and a section coming up. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Jamal. <clears throat> Hey, thank you, Ryan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, just want to do a quick sound check before I start. Uh, thank you, Carmela. You focus on the many things that I usually focus on. So I'm going to try to uh, skip over the thing that you you emphasize. Certain things I'm going to repeat just just for emphasis. Uh, next slide, uh, Brian. Ryan, next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, this is a this is a slide I call inspections, and I list the different type of inspections that we expect the engineer record to attend and perform. And the first and the most important one, in my opinion, is the first one, which is an ongoing inspection at which we expect the engineer of record and their team, be it an employee of the company or a special test, special inspectors, they perform the ongoing inspection. They perform an inspection of the ongoing construction, making sure they have a presence on site. For a larger project, we expect that they have an office and a, and a constant present. Obviously, for smaller project is more difficult or more expensive. So we expect them to visit the site as often as, as they can, as often as necessary for them to satisfy themselves to write the 212 or the 314. And those are the certification package. And I always say, if you read those certification package, uh, the engineer record is is taking a lot of liability here, and really, I mean, they certify that all the work performed by the contractor is in accordance with the drawing specification, all applicable codes, all the fire alarms are being tested, everything is being tested, and whatever signal is been communicated to the central monitoring station. The other inspections that we expect the engineer of record to attend, those are the preliminary inspection in which the engineer of record will visit the site. Uh, Jamal? Seems we may have lost connection with Jamal. Jamal, can you hear us? He's still on the call. Right? He's still on the call, yeah. No, he's he's not muted. Looks like we just lost connection with him. Um, interesting. Okay. Well, Jamal, yeah, we can do a Q&A. Well, let's do a Q&A while Jamal returns. Oh, yeah, uh, let's just answer the question that we had before already in the in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so just, uh, Ryan, if you can show how to find the documentation in the... Uh... Oh, looks like he's back, hold on. Oh, he is back? Okay. Yep. Jamal, can you hear us? Give him a second or two because I see he logged in probably from his phone. All right, why, why don't you do it anyhow? Anyhow, just to, so we're not wasting the time. And once he's back, okay. let me bring this up. So, Clay, to answer. Your question, I'm going to come over here. Um, and just to demonstrate how to find all the documents, let's just do this part so we don't have to come back. Absolutely, to... no worries. So, Clay, when you log in into the PAMYNJ.gov um, on the search bar, you can type TCAP. Uh, the tenant, it will show the tenant construction and alteration process. This is our home site. In this home site, you would find all the supporting documentation that you will need. Um, so, for example, this interactive roadmap, which I'm going to uh, demonstrate now, you also find all other documentation, such as bulletins, forms, checklists, um, our upcoming webinars, if you want to register, and then our previous presentation webinars are here. So, all presentations um, that we've done so far, you would find them here, the PDF, the PPTs. So for your question, you will download this. You will click here on this roadmap, and they will download this document, which is the, the roadmap. 
with every box is dynamic, so it will download an additional document. In the case, and for your case, um, you will need the orientation meeting. And here in this orientation meeting presentation, let's go down to basically just talks about us and the TCAP process overview. The difference um, between TAA and MWA is right here in this presentation. Um, basically, it's TAA is used to follow all construction and alteration work that involves cold issues or impact of any life safety systems, such as fire protection systems, ventilation, egress, facility structural integrity, or hazardous material. The minor work does not involve any cold issues. It's a little above the regular mm -hmm. routine maintenance, but uh, that's why we require the minor work application. Ryan, if you can just go back to the, uh, even even before that slide. If you are not sure if your project is a minor work application or, um, are you ready to lose yeah. you guys? No, we're here. We can hear Jamal. Just hold on, uh, Jamal, for a minute. All right, let, let us just finish yes, this. Yes. If if you are not sure. sure if your project is a minor work application or tenant alteration application, you can submit uh, the request for project determination and it will be answered. it you will also you will need to submit the project initiation form taa minor work application 01 and based on the scope of work you'll get the response back saying yes please proceed under taa or your work is okay to proceed on under minor work application and if you go back to 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 page that, yes, to the next page. So it has some examples of what any any excavation soil. It's it, it will have to be any environmental issues. It will need to have to be the tenant alteration application. The carpeting, the routine maintenance um, activities that are above the a little above the. Uh, uh, you know, more involved scope. They will they they will need to be submitted uh, under the minor work application. So you can you have some clear examples here: replacement in kind, lighting, plumbing fixtures. So it, it it's all in here. And if you are not sure, consult your tenant coordinator, and they 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 will help you to identify. But based on the scope, if you're putting the EV charging station, it will have to be the uh, um tenant yeah. alteration application yep all the forms you need and all additional documentation you can also find it right here um so right. whatever question you may have please ask your tenant coordinator and as well you can reach out to us and we can uh, direct you in any point of direction i just want to make sure that we answer the question do you have any follow-up questions on this one all right jamal welcome back Thank you. Go to the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, a uh, uh, Carmela talked about inspection hierarchy, so. I, I don't want to take too much time here. I just want to emphasize one thing. Uh, the inspection uh, responsibility lies in the in the in the lies with the engineer records team and only with them. Port authority does not perform any inspections. Uh, not QAD, not REO. We only do audits and uh, just verification of of life safety elements, the 100% inspection is a responsibility, responsibility of the engineer for it. Uh, so I, I just want to really emphasize that even though Carmela talked about it and, and, and Dan, I believe was with her. Uh, next slide, please. And I believe that the next slide was also covered well by Carmela, which is a listing of all required documentation prior to the inspections, 
uh, I'll go through them very quickly here. The cover letter certification, which is uh, 212 or 314 for partial on the final. A sketch if necessary. And that sketch I want to just re-emphasize here. If, if, it's, if it's necessary, must be uniquely numbered, must be signed and sealed, must be dated and include a TA number and must be referenced on the certification letter. And of course, you have the special inspection checklist and the special inspections themselves and the record documents. Next, please. Uh, the next slide really talks about uh, and Next slide talks about inspection scheduling and design comments. And also Carmelo talked about that. I just, uh, for emphasis, I want to just highlight how difficult it is to hold an inspection with writer comments. Uh, when, you, when you do have writer comments, then technically your design is not complete. So having a final inspection with the, when the design is not complete just adds another layer of complication that, that we really don't need. So I wanna just advise that the, the tenant coordinator being your best friend, we he, he or she will guide you and help you to resolve writer comments very early in the TAA process. And if we get to the pre-construction meeting with writer comments, then uh, the REO team would help you and guide you. And uh, here I want to say that if, if there's a writer comments that you don't know what to do with, you're not sure what it means, uh, the design standard unit, which is our sister unit, will be more than glad to meet with you and explain to you uh, what it means and the type of uh, uh, the, the type of code that 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 we believe you're violating. So uh, we we you know when we, if we get to the inspection phase of the job, we will not we are not going to accept any inspection requests for TAAs with the writer comments remain to be resolved. So that is. Uh, that that's the decision we made. We just we're not gonna we're not gonna attend any finals. Uh, we we will attend partial if the t if the if the writer comments don't relate to the work that's being inspected. But uh, if the, if the writer comments affect the work being inspected, uh, we, we're gonna refuse to attend the, that inspection. So please uh, understand that, and uh, and uh, uh, so please. Uh, Go to go to the next. Uh, I'll get another phone call. I'm sorry, but uh, go to the next slide, please. I'm just I just uh, switched it off. Now, who this slide talks about who attends inspection, and I get this question a lot. Who should be at the inspection? And from the port authority side, we know who who needs to be there. REO, QAD, and, and other necessary stakeholders depends on the scope of the job. But from the tenant team, we like the tenant to be there. And more importantly, we like the engineer for record to be there. Okay. Engineer for record must attend and, and must be ready to answer questions, which mean it must be somebody who's familiar with the TAA. And I think Carmelo alluded to that too. Uh, we need somebody that can answer question. If there's deviation from the TAA scope, from the DA, TAA installation, we need somebody who can answer that. Why did you do this instead of what's the drawing call for? Uh, so, and I'm talking about, you know, little deviation. If there's minor deviation, there's another process for that. And we're going to talk about that in, in, the, in the few slides ahead. But uh, if there's an engineer of record that's present, that can answer questions that may arise during the final inspection, 
that help the final inspection move quickly and it 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 may save us from writer comments if the engineer of record have a good answer for why he did what he did so so the first is the engineer of record second is a contractor you know he or she's the one who's going to present the project to us subcontractors if necessary if there are tests like fire alarm and, and so he can reset things and that kind of stuff also contractors should be should be ready to present the job with any tools required if there's ladders required lifts whatever it takes for us to to see the project and and assure ourselves that that the project was built in accordance with the drawings and specification and meet the code uh and and sometimes the tenant may have to make some announcement if there's far alarm test to the building occupants so that's 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 another that's why the tenant may need to be there uh, next slide please so this is the that's the team basically that we expect to see at the final inspection uh, the other question that i get a lot is what what do we look at doing the final inspections and uh, I want to start by saying that we only look at the code related items and life safety elements. We are not, uh, it's not like we don't care, but uh, we, we don't, we're not interested in, in, in the elements that are not life safety. Elements. If you got somebody else, we'll, we'll look at them. That's as as a as an architect as a tenant you'll look at whatever color that you want to make whatever carpets whatever tiles we are focused on the life safety elements and the first thing we focus on is egress egress is, is in my opinion is the most important thing in an architectural uh in the architectural field so the egress is comprised with with many little different elements such as the egress path being the dimensions and and uh, and the distance uh we look uh at the exit signage make sure they're clear and they point you to to the right place and they're not confusing they, they there's no exit signs that conflict with each other uh we look at the egress path as i say and we walk it we walk from from the furthest point in the in the in the in the office or in the terminal all the way to the stairs and all the way down the stairs uh we look for emergency lightings those are maybe tested at night but we we either attend those or we look for reports we look at the stairs the doors the hardwares of the stairs uh how difficult it is to open the stairs does it open the right direction uh, and we take it all the way outside to the to the to the sidewalk or to the safe dispersal area. Uh, another thing we look at is the fire rated separation. If there are rated walls that are required, or shafts, or floors, we make sure it's constructed in the way that's supposed to be constructed. We don't perform any destructive testing, so we try to see uh, places where we can see the makeup of the wall how many layers of sheet rock does it have is it taped is it spackled does it have uh you know penetrations and, and all of these things uh we look for dampers uh which is in my opinion the architectural features because they are open and protective if there are fan shut downs required a sequence of operations uh, we look for door releases and latches and label. All these things are open and protective. Uh, we look for extinguishers, elevator recalls. Uh, we look for ADA compliance, of course. Uh, I think uh, Carmela talked about that a, a little bit, whether it's uh, egress, whether it's uh, accessible uh, route or bathrooms or, or whatever. And we look for other other elements also as necessary by the scope. Uh, next slide, please, Ryan. So this is basically a list of you know a few things that that we look for, and uh, the next slides we will talk about the elements that we find missing a lot, uh, or you know you, you could call it uh, common deficiency items, if you will, 
And uh, here I have them listed here, and I'll go through them. First one is really the fire fireproofing and fire stopping. This is very commonly missed, uh, uh, you, know, you know, element uh, fireproofing. We we notice that in many cases, uh, it get damaged during construction uh, when you know either missing or somebody chip a little piece to to hang uh, a pipe or something. And uh, they forget to they forget to pack it. So this is something we find very often. Uh, Sometimes we find fire rated construction that is not built as such. Uh, we find that rated walls may not go to the ceiling, and rated walls with a lot of openings, shafts is a commonly missed thing. Uh, elements. Uh, fire stopping is another very very common uh, deficiency. Uh, all fire rated walls, any penetrations that you make through them, whether it's a floor, a wall, or you know, or stair shafts, uh, we expect that be fire stop with the same rating uh, assembly that 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 it deserves. Uh, hatches. We found that if you have a rated ceiling, for example, and you you're required to put a hatch in it to access uh, something above the ceiling, whether it's a fan or or AC unit. In many cases, we found that those those hatches are not rated or not labeled. Uh, and if they are, uh, you know, if they are, you know, if they're rated, obviously they have to be rated. But if they're rated, if the ceiling is rated, so and we expect to have that uh, that have a self closing device, which is like a spring. To make sure that it doesn't stay open. Uh, another common common limit item is is, is uh, fire rated doors don't have labeled or they have labeled that's painted over. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you have a rated door, it must have it must close and latch by itself. So it must have a self closing device. It must latch and it must have a coordinator. If it's a double leaf with an asterisk. Uh, again, we talk about the egress path here. We 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 find a lot of common deficiencies in the egress path. Sometimes it's not cleared. If the lighting may not be sufficient, uh, the stairs, the way that the doors to the stairs, the the dimensions, sometimes they're off. The swing of the door, the hardware, sometimes the the non-compliance. And as I mentioned earlier, we we take the egress every exit route. We walk every exit route in the building, and there may be dozens of those. And we take it all the way outside. Uh, we pretend we passengers if it's an airport, and we just take it all the way to the outside, and and we check for all the elements that are required. Uh, exit signs we found that sometimes they installed in. Not in the correct locations, or they confuse them. They they provide conflicting directions to to a passenger. That sometimes he sees two exit signs that are that are within close proximity to each other. One takes them east, one takes them west. So we expect that the engineer freckled uh, do his due diligence to make sure that they they are they are clear. Uh, Another common things we found that the exit signs may be uh, maybe blocked by furniture and things of that nature. So we we look for the exit signs to have an obstructed view, and uh, we make sure that it that it is in fact fed from an emergency circuit. Uh, emergency lighting is another thing that is part part of egress, and we look at. We looked at the requirement for the egress path, which is usually higher than the requirement for throughout. Uh, so we test those and uh, we take the reading. We make sure that they are they are compliant. And uh, the ceiling construction, sometimes we found deficiencies in that in the supporting system. And uh, the light fixtures, sometimes if they are above certain weight, we found that they're not supported ind independently as required by code. Next, Ryan, next slide, please. 
So th these these are common items that we find, and uh, there is a more complete list which which is uh, on ENet. I think uh, everybody can have access to that. I just put the 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 very common ones here, and just to continue with that list, there's a few more items here. Uh, Signage and distraction band uh, on the glass partitions in the lobbies. We found that very often they missed. And, uh, you know, the ADA compliance, we talked about that, uh, whether it's in the bathroom, accessible route. We, we also walk it. We make sure that that all the slopes uh, are in compliance. We make sure there's no, you know, anything that's that's required that, that, that it is installed. And, uh, uh, dampers we find very very uh, too many problems with dampers we found and uh, we look for for certain things in dampers and uh, we start doing certain things to elim to eliminate those uh, deficiencies in dampers uh, and what we do now we we, we perform walkthroughs early in the process to make sure that you know, once you finish your first or second damper, that we put eyes on it, and we make sure that it's it's gonna it's gonna pass our you know our tests. Uh, but generally, for the dampers, we we're really not looking for anything more than than what's required by code. We make sure that the damper is in the right location. Uh, we make sure that the openings around the dampers is is framed as required by code. Uh, we make sure that the size of that opening is is in compliance with the with the manufacturer's instructions, uh, and it's it generally relate to the length of the damper and the width of the damper. Different manufacturers allow different things, but you know you don't want an opening that's too big or too small. Uh, another thing we look for: we make sure that the blades are in the plane of the wall being protected. Uh, we make sure that this ID tag on the damper with the unique identified permanent uh, label. This way, this damper can be can be referenced easily if there's a, a problem with it, if there's maintenance, uh, whatever. So it's it's easy to get to that damper. Uh, we look for the breakaway connection, which basically keep the damper in the wall in case the 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 the, the, the duct fall. We look for the retaining angle and where the number of screws and the, and the, the whereabout of those screws are are very critical. We look for access doors, which is important that we can inspect the damper, and the uh, damper can be reset, can be worked on. And uh, the last thing, uh, you know, this is a mock-up, which is not necessarily built for us. The mock-up, don't don't misunderstand me. A mock-up could be the first production damper that 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 you build, and you present it to us uh, for examination. Before before you build, you know, twenty, thirty, forty other ones, and and we found issues with them. So this is a service that that we offer. Uh, you know, the minute you finish one damper or two or three, whatever, maybe you want to. One from each kind. If you have a floor dampers, if you have a wall dampers, uh, so you present it to us in, in an inspection format or walkthrough format, and and we'll inspect it and we'll critique it for you before you build others. Next slide, please. Uh, so that that really eliminated a lot of the the damper issues that we used to have in the past. We used to have a lot of problems. Now we are we are much better. Uh, with with the with the dampers than before, and before I leave the dampers, I, I want to make sure that I communicate this with you. Uh, uh, dampers are listed devices, so the manufacturer tested them in a certain installation procedure, and uh, the word of the manufacturer it carries a lot of weight with us. So. Uh, if there's any deviation from the installation of the damper, you know, we will we'll tell you get that manufacturers to accept it or give you uh, or give you uh, if let's say the damper is at the, not on the, at the plane of the wall, for example, it's off by a few inches. 
So we tell you to contact the, the manufacturers, be it Ruskin, Imperial, whoever, and uh, and they will they will tell you how how you know what to do in this circumstance, what you need to do. Sometimes you wrap it. Sometimes, if it's small enough, they'll tell you it's good as is. But we need something from them to uh, to tell us that this damper is is, is in compliance with the man, with their instructions. Uh, here, and I notice we don't have a lot of time, so I'll go through quickly. Uh, after the inspection, we, uh, with the with the leadership of the REO, will will uh, gather all comments from all parties, and uh, will electronically distribute them or load them into a system that that everybody uh, that everybody can access. And uh, we expect the engineer record to answer, and uh, ver and verify their completion, and invite us for a retest. Next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, I think Irina could tell you that uh, we are going to the e builder. So a lot of this slide is basically talk about the portal, which shortly will be uh, phased out, and. Uh, a uh, helpful hint, uh, I want to focus on one thing here, uh, which is a change of scope. Uh, change of scope, uh, uh, we expect the engineer to, to make sure that, that they build the TAA in accordance with their own drawing. Okay, this is not a poor authority drawing, this is your own drawing. So please make sure that it's built that way. And if you build it exactly like you designed it, you're not going to have any problem with anybody in the poor authority. Okay, so uh, the problem happened when there's deviation, and and deviation happen sometimes they are unavoidable because of field conditions. You're forced to do something instead of another, and I'm not talking about you know something moving conduit from this wall to this wall. That's not the one I'm talking. I'm talking about uh, you know we attend inspections and we find that. The engineer record decide to derate walls, eliminate dampers, and on their own, they value engineer something, and uh, and uh, and we found something that was built that is totally different from what we approved, and we have a problem with that. Okay, so uh, if if there is a deviation that is life safety, uh, that affects life safety or code, we expect that change to be uh, to be updated in the drawing and we expect that those drawings be resubmitted to DSU design standard unit for 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 reapproval and if you are not sure about if this deviation rise to that level or not then your best friend is REO you could you could ask them and they will guide you in that process but the process is very very similar to to the writer comments process so you you just have to to write a little narrative saying that you, you you're changing this instead of that and 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 revise your drawing and submit it but this has to be done very early in the process not at the final inspection if at the final inspection you're ready to occupy tomorrow or, or next week there's no time to do all of that the first the minute that you discover that you have to deviate from the drawings is you call the reo and 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 advise them, and they and they'll guide you through the process. Next slide, please. Uh, I I think the the rest of it is uh, just uh, helpful hints. Uh, this is a uh, we talk about the change of scope, uh, and striving for excellence. And I, I my best advice to you: build it like you, like you designed it. Uh, sometimes it's, it's it's not worth it to deviate from from the design. It's it's gonna it's just gonna cost you more money and more headaches to 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 resubmit things. It's gonna delay your process. We try to well try to you know to to give you an answer as soon as we can. But sometimes during the final inspection, really it's not the time to discover that you deviated, you derated walls, you eliminated dampers. You change your egress from from you eliminate an egress door. This is not the kind of things that 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 we really can can deal with during the final inspection. It's too late 
it's too late for that. Uh, next, I believe this is the last slide, and uh, you can we can open the floor for any questions. I'm sorry, yes, it ran a little long. No worries, no worries. Um, we can go ahead and stop the recording now, and we want to ask.